Hello, everyone. Um, I am Renata, the conference Teverishia host. And today we have Kamal Ahamada with us. Uh, Kamal is an educator and a public speaker around the themes of race, culture, identity, and diversity. And currently he's based in Vilnius, where he teaches and gives also independent lectures on these topics. Hello and uh, welcome. Hello, Renata. Thank you for having me. Very excited to start this conversation. So how come you came to Vilnius one day? Yeah, I guess like every foreigner would say, my wife brought me here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh nice. I think most of the foreigners here uh, at least from Western Europe, they would say the same, more or less the same thing. Yeah, my wife is, is Lithuanian, so so I didn't have really a choice here. I just had to come. And then, uh, yeah, and I love it. I do love it. Yeah. How, how long have you been living here? Oh, it's been three years already. It's been three years and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying every single bit, even the winter. Yeah. I'm enjoying it. Like yeah, I love 20 last year. <laughs> what? Say it again. Like last year, it was minus 20. Yeah, it was minus 20. Uh, I mean, the first year that I came, uh, there was such a um, um, harsh winter. It was snowing and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And then the second year, it was okay. Last year, I got tired a bit of it. But when we look at the changing seasons, it's so beautiful, you know, from winter to spring and then spring, or spring, summer, and then autumn. That's such a beautiful time. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. nice to hear. Um, how were you welcomed? I mean, how did you feel when you came here for the first time? You know, the first time I came here was 10 years ago, like mm. visiting. And then, yeah, I had all those looks, you know, you know, being a, um, a black guy in the street of Vilnius and uh, with his hair. So there was a bit of curiosity and, uh, and it's, it was nice, you know. And now it's a bit less. Um, so I believe people get used to see uh, foreigners around, which is, mm -hmm. a, which is a good thing. And it's actually the whole environment that changes. The streets and are changing in Vilnius. The, the whole design of the city is changing. People mm -hmm. are changing. I mean, it just, and I'm happy to see that, that change, you know, I see it I, through the, uh, the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, uh, I see and, um, and I appreciate it. it's a positive change. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I like that it, it becomes more diverse. Yeah, uh, I like the fact that um, you know that also still people are curious about the others. It's not like mm -hmm. yeah we have foreigners and then that's it. And people are like, why are you why are you here? You know, <laughs> so why are you in this place? <laughs> so yeah, they are quite they are quite interested, but um, nicely interested about you. Yeah, they are more curious than uh, let's say unhappy. Yeah, yeah that's what, that what I'm experiencing. But uh, again, I'm talking about a Western uh, Black perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, um, foreigners coming from straight from the global South, uh, it is less appreciated. So the way what I'm trying to say, it's visible when you have... Uh, someone like me from uh, France moving in the city, there's a way of occupying the space, you know, mm. that I feel comfortable with. But if you take another uh, black foreigners from Africa, then he would be more shy and it would be more visible the mm. way he, he moves, the way, and then people feel it. People feel that, you know, um, people feel that a person is not, come, uh, is not from here and then uh, they label quite easily. And, uh, but still, I also got some, uh, some very harsh statements from people. Um, so being from the West, it doesn't prevent uh, you from having 
uh, some um, nasty comments. Yeah, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say that those who come from the straight from the global south, you can see now about the refugees and stuff. It's much harder. It's much much harder. Yeah. So would would you say that um, would you say that people are <laughs> accepting and tolerant about other or others or people which are very different from us or mainly I, I mean mainly or are we like kind of afraid and uh, do not really know what to do with it I think it's a it's a natural process you know mm -hmm. uh, Lithuania becoming uh, more international then uh, people have this uh, natural questions you know and they are curious and they are also rejecting so that that's a normal thing to uh, for a society to go through and uh, I believe uh, it's and I hope it's gonna get better uh, you know but uh, people always compare at least Lithuanians uh, compare Lithuania to uh, to France or England and so on and they actually very critical about themselves, you know, the Lithuanians saying that, yeah, we are not good enough. We are not open enough as a society and mm -hmm. so on. But it's not what, a, as a person, as a black person from the West, I've never felt so good in a place than in Lithuania. It's yeah. just to say how bad it is in other societies. Uh, it's not because you have diversity mm -hmm. that you are more tolerant. And we will make a lot of, mis uh, of misunderstanding about it. It's not that a society is diverse, that it's more tolerant. Mm. So what we need to learn, it's, um, uh, it's um, really values, you know, what do we wanna, uh, what do we wanna have as values? Uh, the case of France or England, or even the United States, which is the most visible case, it just confirms what I'm saying. It's a, it's a multicultural, society taking New York or Paris or London, these are multicultural societies, but the level of racism uh, and uh, discrimination is very, very, very high. So it depends on what you do with this diversity, you know. So France, England, uh, these are not examples of, uh, you know, welcoming people. Mm -hmm. These are not the best examples. I love that. But you say that diversity in itself isn't enough for being tolerant, that yeah. we need values around it. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. And uh, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, I did that a couple of times. It's not my best, uh, my, <laughs> the work that I like the most, but, I'd, um, but uh, I, I do it, you know, training on diversity. Uh, this is so overrated because, uh, you know, diversity it's not because a company has a mix of uh, of women that there are a lot of women in the company that it means that there's less sexism mm -hmm. in the company you know or it's because they have more black people that there's less racism or brown people uh it's just the values that you want to uh as a manager that you want to uh, you know um spread in your company yeah. Mm -hmm. So these values need to be learned, but also unlearned because uh, the values that are that exist in a company, uh, it's scary. It's a it's a mini uh, patriarchal uh, white male society, and then th this need to be unlearned. So it depends on the manager what what he understand by sexism, by patriarchy, by disability. Uh, by anti-gay, by um, racism and so on. So, and the need to be uh, big, uh, just one time or two, it's not just one time or two times training. It needs to be a real process of learning uh, how to read these systems of, uh, of discriminations and oppressions. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 told you just before the interview that I spent more than 20 years abroad living in your country, France, and then Belgium. So I was uh, in touch with this diversity that you are talking about. And still, <laughs> when I got um, 
my children and when they were still very young and when this black, uh, black Lives Matter happened in the USA, I was like, how, what, what, what do I say? How do I say? Where do I even begin to explain this, you know, complex uh, history? What do I say to my children? And I think people living here, like in Lithuania, we are confronted with the same fears. We are afraid to even talk about it because of fear of being, you know, awkward or not, of not knowing what to say or what words are appropriate. So how do we talk about race with children? Yes, that, that's a, co a complicated question, actually, because um, I also have the same questions. I have a uh, have a child who's six, you know, just turned six. So uh, she also witnessed that Black Lives Matter thing. And um, it all depends on the relation that you have with your child. So when uh, an event takes place, such as Black Lives Matter, and then it would feel unnatural for you to start talking about race suddenly. He wouldn't, uh, he, he wouldn't connect to that for any parents, you know. And that's what happened for most of parents who are interested in that topic. They suddenly started to talk about race and then the child would be like, what, what are you talking about? So, you know, it's about really starting this culture of speaking to your child in, in a way that is, uh, you know, that is uh, constant. And it doesn't have to be related to race. It can be related to social issues. So maybe instead of talking about race, talk about social justice, what it means. For example, for, for my child, like when we go to the street, when we walk and we see these benches, we have benches now, so people don't notice that. But we have these benches where you sit or next to the bus or near the bus stop. And now these benches have separations. You know, they have these separations, one seat, one seat, one seat. So what people don't know about it, this meant to prevent homeless people to lay down, you know, and it's all over the places. Yeah. Um, so what you can ask your child is, oh, this bench, this bench is interesting. What is so, well, what have you noticed about that, that, that bench? And probably he'll say like, something along what you want to, um, what you want to go for. And you start the discussion from, from there. You can say, oh, poor people where uh, when they are tired and they want to sleep, they want to lay down, but now they can't lay down there. So how come they cannot lay down there? Because some people decided that it's not good. And children have this sense, this strong sense of fair and unfair. So he would probably say, that's not fair to do that. Mm -hmm. And then you start with, little by little talking about uh, social justice. And one day the idea of race, for example, will come up. And if you wanna start from the early age, um, you, if you meet um, two um, um, uh, brown black or black family, or you can say, you can start the other conversation that way. Oh, no, that's family, it's beautiful. Have you noticed something interesting or something about that family? Probably the child will say, oh, the hair. No, the hair is interesting. And then you can start with that. So what's up with the hair? Oh, they look so different than mine as a white person, if you go. Um, they look so different than yours. And then you can start explaining why we have different colors, where we come from and so on. So does it make a difference to have a different hair? No, it, it doesn't, you know, and, and, and so on and so on. So you start with questions related to what your child is interacting with, uh, whether in the street or whether with another child or when he plays, um, you need to take that opportunity to engage with your child on his own terms, not coming with a something about Black Lives Matter, how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna uh, discuss race with my child because it, it is difficult, but the child sees the differences anyway the differences of how people are reacting in the street. And then he might ask why they are reacting in the street, you know, why they are protesting, you know. 
And then you can have another term instead of protesting. My child was afraid of all these protests, protest, you know. So she thought it was aggressive the way they, they were protesting. Mm -hmm. And then I said, no, it's actually protecting. They are protecting rights. They are protecting human values. They are protecting your right to speak or to, to live or whatever you come up with. So these are all the ways to engage with the children in a, not using race terminologies at this age, but there will be an age where you have to use because that's the reality. But yeah, you can start with, um, with simple conversations uh, with his environment, with his friends, like um, who were you, if it's about the school, who were you sitting next to today? That's something I ask a lot. Who are you sitting next to? Oh, I sat with uh, um, I sat with um, Augustus. Oh, is he your best friend? So what do you talk about? And so, on. what was the funniest part of your of your day today? Uh, who are you very nice with? Who was nasty with you, or who was not so nice with you? And what did he say? And then last time I found out that one of her friends called me Kaka. Yeah, so that's interesting. I said. Yeah, she called me Kaka. Why? Oh, because maybe you you brown or you're black. Then I started to have this conversation with her, but I found out about this because I started from very far, you know. Mm -hmm. So now I know that her friend called me Kaka, you know, and I know that her friend is a is afraid to meet me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we say hi from very far, you know, <laughs> but these are, yeah, I know, but these are terrible things, actually, that parents need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. The culture that, that they are, uh, are spreading at home, it's in school, you know. Of course, the child wouldn't call me Kaka if she, if, uh, she has heard something nice at home from her parents, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all of that. So you are saying that first of all, we should um, maybe look at our own attitude as parents. I mean, who we are friends with, how many diversity there is in our natural life. Yeah. And then starting from there and diversity that that could, you know, go lengths uh, elsewhere. It's, it, it hasn't be, a, it, it, it mustn't be about race. It could be about you know, social status, I guess, um, a race also, but not only like um, anything that is different from how we live. Yeah. How much yeah. of this different things we accept in our life and how do we talk about it to children and start with daily situations like at school, how did it go? What did you like? What didn't you like? What was the most funny thing today? And then maybe let children feel confident and tell us things about like, oh, you know, he bullied me because I don't speak Lithuanian very well, for instance, yeah. Or, yeah. or other thing, and then start from there. Um, yeah. at, and and I'm also wondering about this, you know, let's talk about how children treat each other. Uh, so let's say <clears throat> my son is, uh, is, uh, I don't know, he doesn't speak Lithuanian, right? Because we lived abroad. This is not true, he speaks Lithuanian, but just for the sake of argument. And when someone tells him, you know, you're not Lithuanian because you don't even speak Lithuanian, let's say, um, what do we do with it? Or someone would say, you know, you are black or you are Asian or, you know, or whatever. What do we do with it? Which words are okay, which aren't? I mean, saying to someone, you are black, it's a fact related to your skin, I guess, color. And it's also, it could also be uh, meant and understood as, a, as a, you know, something that diminishes you because you are just on your skin color. How do we navigate through it? Yeah, the, the, that's a good point. You know, the, the, the main thing when you when you label people, mm -hmm. it's what is associated with it. Yeah. Like blackness is, is associated with for this little girl, it's caca, but for what it means, it means 
you are less valuable intellectually mm -hmm. uh, or the, than, than us. That's how blackness is associated. The same with uh, what we call disability, yeah, which is not a good term, but what is associated with a disability. It means that you are not as able as us physically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so how to um, and the same for many many other things like the the um, the different the, the example with the uh, uh, child not speaking the Lithuanian. It's uh, you know so what languages he speaks. Mm -hmm. You know if the if the language is French or is English, he's gonna be less uh, discriminated because it is still cool to speak French or English, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's our school to speak Arabic nowadays, uh, for example. So it's how you associate a language with the value, um, with the value, and that's problematic. And um, and parents should should do the same kind of work as, um, as you were saying, you know, um, how it's about learning their own bias you know it's really about acknowledging what you are what you are um, teaching to your child unconsciously or not uh, you know so you need to take the uh, these terms you need to acknowledge that as a dad you most likely you have sexist comments like which is like 99 percent of the case where um, as a white person most likely you come up with nasty comments about brown and black people because that's the society we people term, uh, say that it's unconscious bias but I have problems with it because we have internalized so much this um, uh, this uh, labeling and associations um, I know that I'm aware last time I had to apologize with my little girl because I was saying that her, she should change her hair. She was very, very upset, you know, but that comes from the culture of men policing or dictating what a girl or woman has to do, has to do with her body, you know, and I have internalized it. And then I had to go to apologize. Oh, this was wrong, you know, now you can free your hair, you can do whatever you want. So we need to acknowledge our own bias and start it from there and then, and then uh, try to engage with a child yeah, in a way that is, you know, uh, that is related to her environment. Um, so that all I could say about it, and uh, you need to know your child as well. You know, you won't have the same approach with your white kids as I have with my uh, with my mixed race child. It's another approach because she she's experiencing it every day, and this comes to the uh, discussion probably of um, when to talk about race to your child, for example. Yes. You know, you know um, studies have shown that very very early age children see differences from very <laughs> early age, and from from four to five, uh, six, from four years old, they start to see the racial difference, and this is exactly what I've noticed with my with my child when she was four. I've noticed that she wouldn't engage anymore uh, so openly with other kids outside because she felt the gaze, the, um, what we call the wide gaze on her, the way they were looking at her, you know. So, so I used to have, I mean, she's still, but she was very open. She would go to the kids, but the way these other kids of four to six years old would look at her, then she, she start, she stopped engaging uh, in a such a way, uh, in the way that she was before. So the way she's reacting in public space is now different because she's witnessing the way we look at her in a different way. Maybe it's not mean, but she feels that she she's different, you know. Um, so, so the way I will talk with her, it will be different because she has direct experience. But the way um, a dominant white society would talk with her, with her children, mm, white mother, white dad, then I would suggest to talk, to really start from uh, these little things 
uh, around social justice. If mm. you, if um, as Lithuania is very white dominant uh, society, then we cannot dismiss the race as as um, in the discussion because we don't have uh, enough black and brown people. We cannot dismiss it. What people don't understand is that race eats everybody. What Lithuanians, for example, experience in Scandinavia or in East London is racism. They associate, not what, yeah, I said what Lithuanians, they experience what racism is. They are looked at as a second uh, white citizen, you know. Um, so it's very visible, even if you try to hide it, there's a time if you come from Eastern Europe as a white person, if you go to Scandinavia, if you go to France, uh, in France in the 80s, we had a lot of Polish people, then they were the target of it. They were racialized. Mm. We'll have to understand that race is a social construction. It's not necessarily about colors. It's how we label people according to their locality or their culture or anything. So yeah, people can be targeted. So Lithuanians, talking from the Lithuanian perspective, they know what is being racialized. They don't have maybe those who are traveling, they don't have the words for it, but they know that there is something going on, why they looked at that way, you know. And then they can start that, the discussion from there, from their own experience, if they are travelers. If they are not, let's look at how we treat disabled people. Let's look how they, we don't look at it as a, uh, we don't look at them as being part of the society. Then you can engage with, uh, your, um, with your child in such discussion. Mm -hmm. oh, I see he cannot walk. Um, so what can we do with it? How come he cannot go to school uh, if he can't walk? So what the school should do? Probably the school should have a lift, you know, why it's missing in a school, in a progressive school. Uh, do you think it's fair that um, there's no access to wheelchairs in, in your school? Uh, what we should do about it? So maybe you can engage in a, in a real discussion with the school, your child. You know, uh, it can also be about social status. My child was, um, there's a nice lady in our school because I teach in, uh, in a secondary school and my child goes to the kindergarten. There's a nice lady, uh, she's the cleaner, you know, and she, uh, and she's very nice. She always says hello and my child says hello. And she was, my child came one day complaining about why she works too much, you know. She's always cleaning, you know, she's always cleaning. Why, why it's, all, it's only her. So that, this was a good time to, to start a discussion about, about, um, about social justice, about status, economic status, about visibility, why this woman is so invisible, why nobody says hello, why it's only you, my child, who says hello. And she, and from that, she offered to help her one day to clean the, the school. And we organized that for her with her teacher. So she went with, uh, uh, she went to clean with that lady. So um, that was teaching her about what is, um, what is invisibility, but not in these terms, you know, why, why nobody pays attention to her. So why it's so important to say hello to everyone, why there's nobody higher than the others. Um, you could also talk about what is uh, being older, because she's an old lady, mm -hmm. yeah? So what the place of uh, older people in our society, are they visible or not? What we should do? So all these kind of uh, topics can be uh, talked through. And then from that, she's ready or he's ready for any other topic related to social justice or race. Yeah. And I love when you say that, you know, racism, it isn't necessarily about race, but it could be about or discrimination, let's say about anything about social status or, you know, um, 
the job you do in a society, the language you speak. I, I remember I caught uh, early fall, last fall, my kids came back from street. They were playing outside and we were like, you know, mom, we met two boys and they wouldn't speak Lithuanian. I was like, which language did they speak? I was like, I don't know, probably Russian. And so I know that they couldn't make distinction. They couldn't have figured out by themselves that it was Russian. So I was like, how did you come up with, you know, the language definition? Mm. I was like, yeah, the other kids, you know, all the ones and they told us. Uh, and the next day, like those kids came over uh, and I was outside in the garden. I was like, oh, it seems like you speak Russian because you can recognize someone speaking Russian. And we were like, no, we don't. It was, oh, that's strange because I understood that, you know, you told uh, my kids that you heard someone speaking Russian in the street. I was like, no, 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 no. We don't even know what language it was. But as they didn't speak Lithuanian, we said it was Russian because, you know, all these Russian people living here from, you know, very, um, like, many years and they still don't speak Russian. And that moment I knew that it has nothing to do with kids or even them able to recognize the language. It has all to do with what they heard someone, meaning adults in their lives, tell about, you know, this minority that we have in Lithuania, like people who only speak Russian, the older people, because they didn't got time or chance to adapt and they kept their language and they still have like trouble speaking Lithuanian when we go to Maxima, you know, or wherever. So they heard someone, an adult, defining, labeling those people as bad or less than us, you know, in mm. some sense. And we were just reproducing what they heard around them. Like we yeah. didn't come up with this idea by themselves. Mm. They just were repeating what they heard, like probably, I don't know, parents, neighbors, grandparents, you know, whoever it was. And that's why it's, as you say, it's this, um, this acceptance about diversity should start with us. Like how yeah. accepting we are, how we notice what's happening around us. Like this cleaning lady who is someone who brings, um, you know, food with uh, Barbora when you order online. How do we speak to those people? You know, yeah. what do we say? Do we say hello? Do we say thank you? Do we acknowledge that they help us? Like, I mean, we are all interdependent. There is no, you know, up or down. We are all mm. on the same level doing what we do. Um, so, but that's the most difficult part, I guess, because we only want to teach children <laughs> yeah. to be all those things, you know, to be open, open-minded, tolerant, and we neglect ourselves. Yeah, definitely. We we, we don't show the examples. And uh, the, the example of Barbara, uh, it's a good one, but also Volt, you know, Volt and Volt, how they, um, how we see them, you know. There's a good uh, documentary about it done by um, Lithuanian person, Karol is his name. Uh, and he made a whole documentary about the invisibility of those, uh, of those people. Mm -hmm. So it's really how we interact with them as um, as parents or as adults that make a, a difference, you know. And also, it's it's about the word view. It's really about your word view. Um, and parents need to be aware of that. Here, uh, what I've noticed, um, okay, the Lithuanian um, uh, children seem to be very reserved, you know, but. Um, and then uh, uh, whenever I would meet one, they be scared of me or, you know, be, uh, be a bit cautious, which is normal. But one day, I still remember that girl, that little girl, um, she, um, I went for, for, for an interview or something, and she was there with her mom. Uh, and then she made a big smile welcoming me and stuff. And I was so surprised because that was the first time. And the mom, what she said, she was so happy to know that because I told the mom that, you know, your child is amazing, you know? And um, she said, oh, I think it's because I've given her dif uh, different dolls, black dolls as well. 
and it is very important. So she was aware of that, even on the diversity of the of the of the toys of the dolls, it made a huge difference because the mom was very cautious about that. You know, what do we associate with uh, with ugliness, uh, for example? So people can say homelessness. Um, people would say blackness, and so on and so on. So that girl was very aware. Uh, she was living in a, already in a diversity world. Mm. Yeah. So my presence didn't shock her at all. Uh, she was like, yeah, okay, welcome and so on. So yeah, parents are important, but also everybody around. So as a parent, you need to educate your grandparents, you know, the whole environment. It's, it, it's not easy, but it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it because it does make a difference, uh, really. Yeah. How, how, as you mentioned, like educating like our own parents, I guess, that from, uh, you know, all the generation. How do we talk to them about it? I mean, what do we say? Um, if someone says some racist, um, uh, you know, word or even sentence, how do we react? What do we say? I uh, really don't know because it's, uh, it is like uh, sometimes a lot scarce, you know. Uh, but what, one thing that I, I think people shouldn't do, uh, those who have, uh, uh, whether black friends, brown friends, uh, gay friends, or people with disabilities, is to, because people do that a lot, uh, is to say, okay, we go to my friends or to my grandparents, they're a bit racist, so, but don't mind about them. You know, they are just old or stupid. But it's something that you, I think, well-intentioned people shouldn't do because it put us in a very uncomfortable situation with a lot of microaggressions. And then mm -hmm. we have to accept it because they are, they are stupid or old and stuff. Um, yeah, and that's microaggression all the time. And we don't need... Um, all these um, people don't need to go through that to, to, to make yourself happy or to excuse you or for something. Uh, and what can be done, it's really um, keep educating, but you realize that it's exhausting to educate people. It's really, it's really exhausting. You know, people should do their homework, you know. Mm. Uh, so, and that's something that I, uh, um, I want to do less, you know, educating people about um, race or discriminative policies and so on, because people should do their homework. It's not, because every time we talk about our experiences, we need to be aware that it's actually relieving the experience from inside. Mm. But it's, it, it's really, it's really a, it's really violence on our psyche and body, whether, I mean, whether you're brown, whether you're disabled and so on. Uh, so asking people to educate other people, you know, I, I say that not uh, because I'm often uh, asked to educate uh, or to go to talk, uh, for example, university. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's for free or most of the time. And then, uh, and then people, you know, they just don't realize how how hard it is because even though you talk about the experience in a scientific academic way, it's still your experience. You know, you can talk about racism in a uh, you know in terms of uh, sociology, political political science, and so on. But as a black person, you or as a person targeted by that or going through that, it's also your lived experience, you know? Mm. So that, that, that is very hard. So what you can say to your friend, it's first to do their homework, and then uh, you can also educate, educate them about it. And then you realize that it's tiring. Mm. <laughs> then you just want a peace of mind for yourself because it's not that easy, yeah. Yeah, and from my experience, when you try to explain something to someone or prove your point to someone, then people get defensive 
and then there is no point there is no more dialogue there is only yeah. you know i am trying to be right and someone else be trying to be right right and, yeah. um usually with children like talking about anything it could be diversity but it could be also boundaries whatever it is i tell them all the time you know that um we are different uh there are lots of things we share in common but we also are different and we see things differently and we use different words and uh, there is nothing we can do about others i mean the way they express themselves or the way they behave that's on them that's how they choose to live their life we can do everything related to us so the words that come from your mouth you choose them and um um and um, I, I don't want, like, um, every time they use, let's say, uh, a not very nice word towards someone, I'm not saying that, you know, they're being nice or not nice people. I'm just saying, you know, this word has this meaning or this word may affect someone and hurt their feelings. Do you really want to use it? If that's what you want to say is, you know, you want to define the curl of the person or the way they speak, you could use this word. It would mean the same thing and it wouldn't hurt the feelings because it would be neutral. Like I'm always trying to show them, let's say, inclusive language, how you can say the same thing, but without hurting, you know, how could we define someone precisely but without attacking him or labeling him and i explained that you know even if it's sad there's nothing we can do about how others decide to live their lives even if it's toward us many come crying from outside like oh mom he said you know whatever i am short or you know mm -hmm. uh that's how this person decide to behave at that very moment but doesn't mean he's a nice or a bad person maybe he was having a bad day himself and that doesn't say anything about you so mm. i'm i don't know if i made myself clear i, mm. I am uh, more into like modeling you know i live by my values but mm. what i believe and this is my way of showing the others that you could too but then it's up on you know them if they choose my path or if they stay you know wherever they are yeah, no, that's correct. I mean, living by example is the best education you can mm. you can uh, give to people and uh, to to your child. Uh, yeah, it's not always easy, right? Mm. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that that the best way of dealing with that, you know. So yeah, totally agree with that. Totally agree. And um, also about uh, it's uh, whether it's um, race or not, but. Um, you know, people have the tendency to say, I don't see color, we are all human beings and so on. So this kind of uh, also uh, not a good statement to start with because children do see those differences. Now mm -hmm. it's about what is so different and what is so beautiful about the difference and what is also connecting us. Uh, but, but being dismissive and saying, I don't see differences, Mm. That it doesn't it doesn't help because children see those differences of color of people of hair of anything they just try to understand you know what uh why there's such a difference mm. you know? yeah. and how how do we deal with all of this in classroom i mean um you know we could be example at home and then kids go to school um how does it happen in classroom how do we address bullying racial and not only in classroom yeah uh, this is tough and i have to say yeah that's uh, a major issue in all the places i've taught uh, but uh, in all let's say in all all societies uh, teaching in uh, teaching in denmark it's an issue because you can see uh, it's about status, it's about disability, that it's also white dominant society. Uh, teaching, um, I haven't taught in France yet actually, 
but yeah, no? uh, but I experienced frauds as a child. So, uh, so yeah, uh, racist, racist practices. Oh, yeah, well, talking for myself, uh, racist practices started from early age. Mm -hmm. So for parents, black and brown parents of mixed race, uh, they have to they have to be aware of that. What's happening in the playground? It's scary, you know. Uh, six years old, five, six years old, you know. Uh, I was always fighting because of the racist slurs and so on, and it's the same today with uh, with kids. Nothing has changed. People think that yeah, we 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 are more tolerant and so on, but nothing has changed. The stories that I hear today from uh, from parents, uh, black and brown parents, it's what I've gone through. You know, the difference is I had a, I had bigger brothers, so they were fighting all the time. But you know, when you're a little girl or a little boy alone in school, it's really tough. Mm. So, and teachers are not trained. Not only teachers in Lithuania, but they are not trained to address bullying. Uh, you know most of the campaigns fail um, to address bullying. And it's actually, uh, it's actually more and more, there's more and more in bullying because you can't disconnect bullying from the society. Uh, it's all connected. I mean, the, if you have a bully society, you have a bully, a bully playground because the bully society bully the, uh, the whole education. It's not, you know, education being the least funded uh, institution in a society, at least one of the least. So it's being bullied. So when you have a bullied institution, you have the institution, the, uh, the institutional people who are bullied. So you have the head teacher who is gonna bully the, the, the teachers and you have the teachers who bully the, the, the kids and not, not even mentioning the academic fields, the pressure that is on the head teachers to perform so that they are better, uh, that the best schools, it's a lot of stress put on them. And this stress, they put that on the teachers. And that's why you have so many overstressed teachers. And these overstressed teachers, they transmit it to your child. Uh, the teachers transmit that to your child, you know, and it's spread around. That's how. That's how most of the bullying campaigns don't function because they don't take the, the issue uh, from the roots. It's about the society, how we can create a better, a better society. So it's the same for race, the same for um, disability, uh, why we don't have access for disabled kids in our school. They are being silenced, they are being invisible. So when they happen to be in a school, then they are being bullied by the kids because they have never seen them. They look so different. We don't know how to deal with that. Um, and when someone is, um, uh, uh, is performing uh, much less, why that child is performing, uh, is performing much lower than the other kids? So what is the place we are, uh, um, I mean, what is the academic value uh, um, of, um, of a school, why a school wants to perform so much, focusing so much on mathematics and science, why the child who's very good at creativity is less valued than the others. And then you have bully on, on that as well. So about the economic status is the same, why there, are, there is so much uh, difference of, um, of, uh, of clothing or fashion from another child to, to, to the other, to the other. So, you know, it, it just, uh, you see in the school, you see it's a mini society. You see how the society is constructed uh, in, a, in that little playground. Uh, how, we do, how do we look at the poor in a society? How we are rejecting them? Then the child with a, uh, who seems to be poorer than the others, then he's going to be bullied. So now how the kid, how the teachers have to address that. Mm. In terms of race, they're gonna say, we are all human beings. We value all the kids the same way, but this is not enough because there are differences. There are differences and you need to tackle that. 
you need to stop everything that you do during um, uh, during uh, the, the, the academic hours. You need to stop uh, and address the whole issue about bullying. You know, it's not like, oh, someone, uh, a child is coming to you and say, oh, he told me that uh, I was not nice because I'm fat, for example, mm -hmm. yeah? So the teacher has to stop everything and address uh, uh, what is sexism, what is grossophobia, as we call it, why we came to that point, you know? And it's every time, if it has to take six months, it will take six months. But what they don't understand that it's actually learning. When you have a good learning environment, free, um, uh, uh, bullying free uh, education um, school, then you'll have a better learning. But uh, teachers and head teachers are so stressed on not achieving what they are required to do. Then everything just piles up, piles up, piles up. So we have a denial of, uh, of, uh, from the teachers and head teachers of uh, racial, um, racial bullying in schools. You know, I have some parents going to mixed race parents uh, with their child, complaining about their child being racially bullied, but the teachers and managers, they say this doesn't exist because we are all human beings. We value each child the same way. But yeah, you know, it is true they do, but it's not the reality of that child. You know, uh, being dismissive doesn't help. And so they are not trained in anti-bullying campaigns, or they are in denial of it. But it's something very, very serious in Lithuania. But not only in Lithuania. Mm. The difference is that I saw that at least, at least the Lithuanian teachers that I work with, they are denying it totally. You know. Uh, but there is as much bullying in, a, in an English playground than in, in Lithuanian playground. The difference is to how you accept it and how you started tackling it. Nice. So I remember when we were looking for a school and a preschool in Belgium, and we visited some of them. And the school that I fell in love with was the school where the principal told us that you know, when we see someone smoking, we stop the behavior and we talk about it, even if it's you know in the middle of the class or you know whatever. When we see someone taking or dealing drugs, we stop it and we talk about it. When we Excellent. see someone bullying someone, we stop the lesson and we talk yeah. about it. Yeah. And I thought that you know that that what we were saying, like even if it takes you know an hour, a day, a month, a year, it's still worth it because it's the only yeah. way to stop it. Because yeah. we, we need to notice it. We need to let other people know that we noticed that it's not okay. And let's talk about it, why it's happening. What are your needs? Maybe what are your unmet needs? You know, yeah. why are you behaving like that? Because, you know, someone who bullies someone else, usually that someone is also oh, hurting. Really. Yeah. And trying to, you know, hide his own weaknesses or sadness or family tragedy, maybe whatever it is. So that person is still hurting. That's very difficult, maybe to apprehend because we, you know, the bully, we tend to think about them as very mean, you know, people mm -hmm. <laughs> in what way, but which is not true. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the teacher who says I stopped my lesson to talk about bullying, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's the way it should be. But I guess, as you say, teachers are not trained for it. Yeah, they they are not, and uh, uh, managers think that a, a one-time campaign is enough. But it's really about keeping it up the the whole academic year and even more. And uh, yeah, and they need to understand how bullying functions, not, uh, and also a lot of uh, these anti-campaign, anti-bullying, they focus on the individual, you know, mm -hmm. uh, instead they, they have to, of course, but they also have to take the whole community into consideration. They need to address parent issues. What's going on at home, you know? Why are you, why are you reacting that way? What is going on? in our school, 
Yeah, what kind of culture we have set in our school that allows this kind of bullying? Are we saying hello to the receptionist? Are we saying hello to the cleaner? You know, are we valuing that person or are we just ignoring it? You know, so being conscious of all of that makes it a good school. You know, it makes a good school. Having experience in education, I know that the school is good from the reception. When the receptionist says hello in a very nice way, I know it's a good school. Mm. You know, as simple as that. Of course, you need to investigate more, but it starts from here, from there. Mm. How we look at these so-called uh, uh, lower jobs or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I was thinking also about this school in Brussels and. Uh, as you mentioned, the receptionist, I remember the receptionist over there and she was like feeling she was a part of the school. Like she was the one showing us around, you know, like this is our garden, this is our canteen, this is our classroom. Mm. She knew everyone by name. Uh, children were coming mm. to her and saying hello and even hugging her. And mm. I, at that point, I didn't know anything about the school, the academic goals or, you know, anything else. I just was thinking, wow, that feels like home. You know, this mm. um, close relationship, this um, kind and warm welcome. Yeah. And I was thinking like, no, someone who feels valued uh, in a school that must be very like, you know, open-minded society or community, you know, also parents, I guess, teachers, mm. and they are all like, in all of this together, like, you know, this big family and it felt yeah. just good, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it feels right. And you feel that your child is in a, is in a good hands, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and um, head teachers should, should really focus on, uh, on, uh, on this sense of community, on making people happy in the school, every single person, you know? Yes, exactly. Thank you, Kamal. That was uh, a pleasure. Very enlightening and um, optimistic conversation, I guess. Um, thank you so much for your time and for sharing. Yeah, thank you. It was very nice talking to you. It was, yeah, it was nice. I, uh, I hope we, we're going to have more conversations in the future. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that your, your public will enjoy it as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a, oh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.